All right, welcome to the Covis Codex. I'm Skidvis, and this is the show where I ask somebody a bunch of questions, and you should know that by now. Um, the first question is, who are you and what do you do? You bet. So my name is Dusty Reynolds, and I'm co-founder and team manager at a startup called RaceNote. RaceNote, what's that do? Uh, RaceNote's a motorsports management platform that makes race teams faster. Our software allows race teams to make better decisions quicker. Wow, that sounds cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions not related to what you do to help people get to know you better and, you know, make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so, um, where did you grow up? I grew up about 45 minutes outside of Omaha, small town of Hooper. Um, so, f- most people know where Fremont's at. It's about 15 miles north of, of Fremont, a town of 850s. And so, um, I always joke, most of my friends went had a high school class that was larger than, than my small town complete. Wow. 850 people? 850 people, yeah. It's probably one of the, those places where, like, the post office is also the fire department. Yeah, you share it. Yeah, anything <laughs> and everything. Everyone knows everyone. I mean, there's there's no secrets that are truly secrets within a small town. Great place to raise a family, just not a place that has the assets and things that I would want to live in right now. But it was a, it was a good place to grow up. Do they have pizza delivery? Um, the, the funny thing is, no, they don't. But the funny <laughs> thing is, is the gas station on Sundays used to be able to go and put an order in, and then someone would drive to Fremont, bring up gobs of pizza, and then they would deliver it. You'd come pick it up at the uh, at the gas station then. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And they stopped doing it? Yeah, the gas station went under, so... Oh, that's, that's why the, the travel... They lost their hub. <laughs> All right. Um, who has been the most influential person in your life outside of your parents? You bet. Um, so I'd say the most influential guy was... Um, he was a bit of a second dad to me. His name was Terry Golder. Um, Terry was a guy that was just... He, he was one of those people that he was jack-of-all-trades, incredibly innovative, and just the sky's the limit. Um, he, he taught me that there's no such word as can't. You just have to figure out a way to get around it. Um, any type of distraction, any type of obstacle, it's an opportunity. Just incredibly optimistic guy, but just a really warm, down-to-earth guy as well that found a way to challenge me. He was uh, um, he was a race car driver as well, so he introduced me to the sport of, of auto racing. Um, and so I traveled all around the Midwest with him, got to know him really well. And um, he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, and he was his nurse at the time um, is now my wife. And oh, wow. so he was influential on so many different levels and just a top-notch guy. Oh, that's really good. That's cool. Um, what's your favorite band? Um, so I'm a big bluegrass guy. Um, I guess I can claim since I grew up, grew up in a town of 800 that I'm a little bit hillbilly. Um, my favorite band is uh, is Nickel Creek. Um, they're, uh, it's a little bit of folk, but it's primarily bluegrass. Um, the the pattern that they went on, I don't know if I'm a huge fan of, in the sense that it's really really polished bluegrass now, and it's, there's not enough flaws, and doesn't seem like something you're going to hear in in Georgia on a back porch. Um, but they're still pretty good. They're my favorite. You ever been to one of their concerts? Um, I have not, believe it or not. So when uh, I was growing up, I really liked them, and then they they all went separate ways, and they just came back together uh, last year. So we're going to try to get out to Chicago and see them this summer. There you go. Take the chance. Uh, what's the scariest thing you've ever done intentionally? Oh boy. Um, so my wife and I moved to uh, uh, Mali, West Africa in 2009. Um, we'd never been to uh, Africa. We didn't know the language and we said we we're going to go live there for two years. That was pretty scary. Getting on that plane knowing we don't know anyone there. We don't have a place to live. We don't know the language. We're just going to get off the plane and have to figure this out. Um, super scary, but incredibly fulfilling at the same time. What did you do in Africa? Uh, we started a company over there. So. Um, we had, I had owned a screen printing company around here and realized that a lot of the sources weren't at the, or a lot of the shirts weren't ethically sourced. Um, a lot of it was coming from third world countries where the, the ethics and the integrity of the company were questionable. And I thought, well, let's try and take care of this ourselves. So we moved to West Africa and started a small t-shirt factory, um, used locally grown cotton. And we disclosed all the numbers we were super transparent about who the workers were from all the cotton farmer, all the way to the cotton farmer to the person putting the tag in the shirt. So we went over there and did that and started that in two years and then moved back here. Is it still going? No, flopped hard. No. <laughs> so we had a, um, you know, we started the attraction about every other month. We made money. Um, and then that's when the government was overturned and Al-Qaeda moved in. Oh. Um, and nowhere in our business plan did we have anything to say, here's what you do when Al-Qaeda moves in. So uh, we lost all tax incentives and at that point it was just crazy expensive. So uh, we limped along for about nine months after that happened and then it just got to the point where we had a big order come in and we had to say no to it. And we thought, if we have to say no to this, what could we say yes to? So, 
And the answer to that was we didn't know, so we just we had to shut it down. And this would have been 2012. So um, we held tight for about two, two and a half years, and then couldn't move past that. Oh, that sounds really scary. <laughs> Probably the scariest thing I've heard yet. <laughs> uh, no one else has mentioned Al Qaeda, so you're in the lead there. <laughs> That's the nail in the coffin there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's one surprising thing about you, other than the, all the surprising stuff you've already mentioned? <laughs> um, I was just as a hobby. There's, uh, and not many people know, but I really enjoy working with furniture, and I love making um, furniture out of uh, either reclaimed wood. And I know it's 100% buzzword right now, but just using old things and being able to manipulate and work them in a way that's something fresh and something new. So all the furniture in your house, you made it. Um, a good portion of it. So especially like our dining room, I, I don't do couches or anything like that because that's way beyond me. But um, done a handful of tables, um, doors, and things like that. We've redone those. Are, those have been done. Um, most of it with wood that has some sort of um, emotional connection to, um, to either me or, or my bride. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Do you do that like uh, for Christmas presents and stuff? You give people chairs or something? I do, but it's kind of gotten to the point now where I've, I think I've oversaturated that. Where they, yeah, number one is when you do something like that, and then they go buy a gift from Target or Walmart or whatever. They just feel like they've been trumped, and that's not the intention whatsoever. Right, yeah. But I've done it so much now that they kind of expect it, and I just don't want to do that because it's a lot of work, number one. <laughs> number two, like, I don't want to be, I don't want to go into everyone's house and see, like, oh, that's all my furniture. It just doesn't make sense. All right. Uh, do you have a favorite movie or a favorite book? Um, so favorite movie, um, it's old, it's cheesy, uh, Newsies. I, I love musicals. Um, I'm a big music fan. I absolutely love um, musicals. Newsies is one of my favorites. Um, then uh, Top Gun is probably up there as well. So I don't know that I've ever graduated from the 80s or 90s. I still like that music, and uh, a lot of the movies from back then I really like as well. So Newsies is up there, um, but then uh, Top Gun also. Cool. Um, favorite book? Um, I read a lot. I don't know that I have necessarily one that I always go back to. Um, Founder's Dilemmas, like that's one that's that's good for me, but that's more not necessarily read to enjoy. It's just necessarily it's one of those things to, to learn. A handbook. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we did uh, at the company and it's been really helpful for us is each employee gets cash at the beginning of the month to go buy books, and then the last Wednesday of the month we have to go through and teach what we've learned that past month. Oh wow! And that's been really good. So that's got me back into the the habit of reading and make sure it's not just something that's for leisure, but it's something that I'm. I'm getting back into that just mindset of always learning. Um, but there's nothing that I can say like I, it's, it's my go-to book. There's a lot of this that, like you said, a handbook where you kind of refer to it and go back and forth with mm -hmm. it. That's a really cool idea. Thanks. Yeah. Did you come up with that? Um, I think my co-founder did, Kevin. Kevin. Any Barry. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin Barry. That's awesome. Um, speaking of musicals, uh, a little while ago, uh, do you, I own the domain sharkjets.com. Shark Jets? Yeah. Any idea what musical that's from? I don't know. West Side Story. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised no one's come knocking on your door for that one. Right? Yeah. That's surprising. And it's .com as well? Yeah. Wow. It's a really cool one. I just, uh, I, I like musicals too. And was, yeah. The domain was available, so I grabbed it for no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know you're a true techie, right? Yeah. Uh, if you could instantly master a new skill, what would it be? Uh, playing the piano, absolutely playing the piano. So I played a little bit as a kid, and then um, I have zero patience. If I don't pick something up really quickly, I just let it go. And so um, I played a little bit of piano, and then I didn't get that mastered. So I tried guitar, I didn't get that mastered. And I've got all these. I could say I'm a novice at a lot of different things, but I absolutely love piano. My son, who's two years old, loves to sit and listen to piano, and so I would love to be able to say that that's a way that we can bond on a deeper level and. Um, I've contemplated going back for piano lessons, but I just don't have the time to commit to it right now. Are you going to put him through piano lessons? If he chooses to do that, yeah, I think. I don't know what the right age is. I have no idea. But um, he loves to sit at the piano right now. And uh, we've got an old piano in our house. He loves to sit there and, and play on it. But it's obviously not what we would call music. It's more noise. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's cool. Yeah, I've always wanted to learn to play the piano, too. Um, do you karaoke? Um, poorly. Yeah, so last time I did it, um, here's my weakness is I don't know what song is good to karaoke and what is bad, and so I picked a really slow Johnny Cash song, and everyone is like, I think they drank exponentially quicker during that time because it was so painfully awkward. So um, I enjoy it. I'm not good at it by any means, but yeah, I enjoy it. Would that be the your favorite song, the Johnny Cash song? 
Probably not. So I, we did a, I, I, what I intended to do was do Burning Ring of Fire, and instead I did um, Walk the Line. And so it was just way, way too slow for, for a bar. But um, I like Johnny Cash a lot too, though, yeah. Good. What would you like to be known for? Um, fantastic husband. Um, uh, great father. Um, someone that's incredibly loyal. Um, someone that is a great friend. Um, obviously, like, those are very kind of cookie-cutter statements. But I think just at the end of the day, like, we always talk about at work and we talk about at home, like good people deserve to be around good people. Mm -hmm. And we just feel like, I feel like there's a lot of times where I'm just not around. Um, I don't feel like I'm always the best person that I can be. And I want people to me when they see me like that is one of the best human beings out there. So at the end of the day, I want people to say like, that's a fantastic person. I need to be around him. Wow. That's deep. <laughs> Reminds of deep thoughts by, by Jack Handy Jack on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really cool. Um, very, uh, yeah. Uh, what is your favorite party game? It could be a board game or a card game or a drinking game. Whatever. Um, have you heard of Mexican Train? No. So it's a Domino's, Domino's game? Domino's, yes. Yeah. Okay. I absolutely love that. Um, I'm not a board game guy whatsoever, but I do like that. And then uh, Pitch. I'll play a game of Pitch any day and all day. It's just a lot of fun to me. Nice. Yeah, I have Domino's. Uh, one of the, when, when I started the co-working space, I thought, like... That's like my childhood memory. We used to play dominoes all the time. Mm -hmm. So when I got the co-working space, the first thing I bought was like the box of dominoes. And like, oh, that's I play awesome. dominoes here all the time. And I've never played it here. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would your friends describe you? Um, I think they would describe me as um, someone that's willing to have their back and um, someone that's loyal to them. I think they would also describe me as someone that's willing to get my hands dirty and regardless of the situation, I'll be available. I think they'd also just describe me as a bit scatterbrained. Um, I tend to be one that has ideas and one is to have fun creating those ideas. And what I've realized is I'm a lot of my friends are executors. So they'll look at that and be like, all right, well, let's, we can't follow what Dusty's talking about. But if work needs to get done, like we know that he'll still be there. He's just not going to understand like the nitty gritty, fine detailed stuff. Um, and I say all that because a lot of the people like that I work with and people like in the startup community are also my tight knit friends. So um, we all often talk about business pretty quickly. And um, yeah, that's probably the best description. I think they'd also say that um, that they um, that I value family and that friendships rarely will, will ever trump spending times with the, with the kiddos. Do you think that comes from being from a small town? Um, yeah, I think that definitely, that's definitely part of it. Um, I think part of it too is like, as a whole in the Midwest, I think that the agrarian mindset kind of infiltrates our minds and our paradigms in kind of funky ways where even though we're in a city, a lot of people who live in the city have some sort of roots or lineage back to, to farming or some sort of agricultural um, background. And like that is very family centric. Everyone needs to eat dinner at six o'clock and the the father may leave after that and the the wife typically is the the one that is preparing the meal and cleaning up and they've had their distinct roles and so i think that could be part of it as well not saying that's the case necessarily for our family but just that the family trumps most things and i think that's one of the strengths that why people move to the midwest a lot of times too is it's very engaging and if i if i got a hold of you and said hey i'm not going to be able to hang out because i need to spend time with my two-year-old there's not a whole lot of pushback where other places that I've been, it's like, oh, well, I see where I, I rate. And um, that's just, it's the beauty of being in the Midwest. I think that, I think it is accurate. Yeah. So you've met people that, that get upset if you want to spend time with your family? Um, like they so, think they take priority over that? So we had a little bit of that overseas um, in the sense where um, they said, well, why don't we just do this together? Like, why can't, why does there have to be that separation? So not necessarily that. I couldn't hang out with them. They're upset about. They're upset that like, hey, why can't I be included? They in wanted that? to be part of your family, right? Okay. Yep. If you had to pick a new name, what would it be? That's a great question. Dusty's pretty cool, but um, <laughs> so random piece of trivia in my small town, eight hundred and fifty. I had twenty people in my class: ten boys, ten girls. Three people out of those ten boys were named Dusty. Wow. So that's a random piece of trivia for you. Um, if I had to change my name to anything. I would say, um, so my son's name is Hudson, and that started seven generations ago, um, but it skipped a few generations in there. So now I've always thought that was weird, um, and I've always wanted a junior, 
So I'd probably name myself Hudson, and that way, that way I could have a junior. <laughs> right. Um, I have the opposite situation happen in my family. Uh, my dad's name was Gabriel, and his dad's name is Gabriel, and one of my brother's name is Gabriel, and all my other brothers, their middle name is Gabriel. <laughs> oh, wow. And it completely skipped me. I have no Gabriel. <laughs> so. we can, you can go back and make a name change. Yeah, I could just add that in there. Assuming you're north of 18 years old, you should be okay. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right. Uh, have you ever had any broken bones? Uh, I have. I had uh, um, lots of broken toes for strange reasons. Uh, broken arm, a broken wrist. Um, but all that was when I was a child. I haven't had anything since. How about stitches? Um, in my knee, yep. Okay. Better than that. No more than that. Do you, uh, with your race note, do you spend a lot of time uh, clearly on, on the track? And do you hang out with the pit crews or anything? Yeah, we do. Um, so customer validate or market validation via customer interviews is something that we keep near and dear to our hearts. And we're really fortunate because our market congregates on weekends. So instead of us having to jump on the phone, we can go to racetrack and talk to multiple customers or prospective customers. So last year what we did is we bought a 14 year old, uh, 40 foot RV and we traveled the country going from racetrack to racetrack. We put on about 10,000 miles, just a little bit North of that, um, in four months and just went from racetrack to racetrack and talked to all these people. Um, and that was great. And so you're talking with drivers and pit crews at all different levels from folks that are, you know, that may spend 500 bucks a year racing all the way to the NASCAR level, just going and interviewing and getting to know these folks a lot better. Cool. All right. So the last question is, uh, do you have anything to pitch? You bet. So, um, right now, um, with, with race note, and I can go a little bit deeper as to what, what the product actually does. Um, what the product does is it allows teams to make better decisions quicker. And so if you look at the, the way that they're logging all their settings in their car, they're traditionally doing that paper and pen. Now they can do it on our app. And based upon that, they can see some trends and analytics as to how to make better decisions to improve their program. Also, it keeps track of what they have for, um, what they keep track of um, for parts usage. So we'll be able to give them indications, say you're gonna have a part that's gonna be going out here soon because we have that knowledge from some of the manufacturers. Um, so we have that at the basic level all the way to the NASCAR level where it's more of an enterprise level solution that lets them manage their entire program. So messaging, all those different types of things is incorporated in the product. Um, so one of the things we're always trying to look at is say, as we get into each different sector and each different class of racing, we always want to be able to find people that are really champions of our product. And we like to find people locally around Omaha. What we've learned around Omaha or even Nebraska, what we found is if we can find someone that we can sit down with and get to know with, um, we can get a lot of valuable expertise from them. So the pitch really is, is if we can find anyone that's a race car driver or has family that's a race car driver or is involved with the team, like those are people we want to sit down and do breakfast or dinner with and just get to know them at a bit deeper level because that's really helped shape our product into what it is. Do you, is it any kind of racing in particular or all? Um, circle track right now primarily, but we're starting to expand and look in the, uh, on our roadmap and say where we're getting to drag racing, boat racing, motocross, whatever it may be. What we like to do is just build out a file for each class. So when we're ready to pull the, the trigger on that, we've got a lot of information in place. So virtually anything long-term, short-term circle track though. Oh, that's cool. And where can they get more information? Racenote.com? Yeah, go to racenote.com. They can always email me. It's just Dusty at Racenote. Original, I know. Um, but yeah, check on there or uh, Facebook or Twitter, obviously, as well. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Dusty, for being on the show. And thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. Thanks for watching the Covis Codex. I'm Skid Viss, and I hope you enjoy watching this show as much as I enjoy making it. If you'd like to see more episodes like this, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and help spread the word by liking and sharing on Twitter and Facebook. Also, I'm always looking for new questions and guest ideas, so please feel free to post your suggestions in the comments section. Thanks again. Peace out.